So here we are, Dennis Hayes. Thank you so much for joining us here on Earth Day. The co-founder of Earth Day back in 1970. Here we are 50 years later. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, really difficult to pretend that I might not be slipping into middle age uh, 50 years later. So when you think of uh, all the changes that have happened over the past 50 years with the environmental movement, what, what gives you hope and, and what gives you pause? What gives me hope are things that are within national borders and within personal behavior. To take the United States as, as an example, and, and back at the start, we really were a leading nation on environmental issues. We've, we've retreated a bit from that leadership position. But in relatively swift order, uh, we, we passed uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Toxic Substances Control Act, the, the FIFRA um, Superfund, <laughs> it just went on and on. National Forest Policy Act. Uh, for about a 10-year period, we fundamentally restructured the way that America does business. And, and I would make an argument that it was uh, the most profound transition in American government uh, and its interactions with the economy since the New Deal. You couple that success with the changes that have taken place in people's attitudes toward their own behavior, the, the walking their talk, uh, changing the food that they eat, the, the fabrics that they wear, the cars that they drive, where they locate their house, what kind of business they get into, how they invest their retirement portfolio, even how many children they have. Uh, all of this for environmental reasons, and it's been pretty profound. Where I get concerned is that once you get outside political boundaries, where you can pass laws that are binding and have regulatory mechanisms and courts to enforce them, uh, we've been vastly less successful. In other areas, such as most profoundly climate change, but also migratory species that cross borders or problems in the open oceans, um, bottom trawling, ocean acidification, um, we, we've been vastly less successful. And that's going to require, I think, a fairly important change in the way that we view ourselves not just as so many tribes, but really as a species that needs to protect its future. You know, we're doing this video or this uh, interview uh, virtually because we're in this very unique situation with COVID-19. And I was just wondering, how do you think this pandemic will affect the environmental movement going forward? The ways that it will affect environmentalism, I, I suspect, are, are really, really difficult to predict. Uh, some of it could be very good, and some of it could be pretty unfortunate. Um, we, we are doing this with a video conference, which means we're not spending any gasoline, and we're moving electrons and, and photons rather than neutrons and protons from my place to your place. Uh, and, and that's, of course, vastly more efficient and much better for the environment. At the same time, a lot of us who take the bus every day are going to spend a period before we feel comfortable getting in those jam things where you're standing cheek and jowl with other people in the future. Um, and uh, how all of that will sort itself out, I don't know. But I, I do know that, that in a field that I've spent a lot of time on in recent years, looking at super green buildings, how you make them really efficient, the first stages of that were you basically cut off air infiltration except through very narrow things with passive house design. That's gotten vastly more sophisticated, and I think in the wake of COVID-19, we are going to be seeing a, a much greater attention to healthy buildings and the way that stuff is transmitted both within buildings and between buildings and the surrounding environment. Then finally, of course, uh, pollutants of various kinds, and especially with regard to respiratory ailments, air pollution, uh, weakens the human system and makes it more vulnerable to some of these diseases. And we have always been most motivated to bring about changes in environmental controls when it has an immediate impact on human health. So this may be one more arrow in our quiver. What message do you have for those of us in higher ed when it comes to environmental education or climate change or all of the above? The risk of sounding a little bit political, but I'll try to keep it somewhat abstract. We, we appear to be in an era right now where at the highest levels in government, 
Uh, there's a repudiation of basic science, a, a scoffing at expertise, um, a, a belief in uh, uh, the ability of leaders to follow their gut instincts and for that to be a more solid basis for decision making than to turn to people who've spent their lifetimes studying things. We're now in a world that is sufficiently sophisticated that that, that just won't work. I believe that what has been done in the past in higher education training, a, a generation of excellent uh, people as researchers and engineers and um, people who become entrepreneurs has been pretty effective in America. And I, I, I genuinely worry that we will not only be losing our lead internationally, but that we will not be preparing uh, the next generation of leaders who will go into office with a respect for expertise. So to the extent that I can do anything to encourage that, uh, it, it's an incredibly high priority for us as a nation. We will only get through these sophisticated problems uh, if we can present sophisticated answers. Good advice. Dennis, thanks again uh, for spending a little time with us here on Earth Day, almost. <laughs> and uh, take care, and we will uh, talk to you soon. Always look forward to our discussions, Phil. Take care. Thank you. And stay healthy. You too. <laughs>